Ich habe es gar nicht richtig aufgestellt. Ja. Hatte ich es auch lieber ein bisschen weiter weg. Ja. Müssen Sie nicht. Ich okay, ich eigne mich jetzt mal den Raum zu. Ja, das ist gut. Und dann, und dann passt das gleich. So, yeah, okay, thank you. Good. Um, I'm uh, from the uh, <laughs> um, and um, I'm a little bit of perspective in the use of mathematics. Um, I personally was trained as a mathematician. Now I'm an economist, and I worked with different other scientists on reflection. Um, not on the math used in the social science research on climate change, but also that has in societies. And you will see what I mean with that with my. And I will conclude today with a statement that use of mathematics science research on climate change has something to do with playing games. Um, and you will see how I mean that as well. Um, but I want to first start uh, with recalling a well, probably well-known anecdote, and I hope it's not repeated at the Diderot Forum every year. That's the anecdote about uh, uh, Leonard Euler and Denise Diderot. Um, actually, it's not a, a real historic event, uh, but it's a well-known anecdote. So the story roughly goes like that, that um, Diderot, who was a, a French uh, philosopher of the Enlightenment and an atheist, was invited to the court of Katharina the Great. And uh, Katharina the Great wanted to test the conviction of Diderot in, with respect to his atheism. And so he made a small plan with Euler, so the story goes. And so Euler approached Diderot in, in, the, in the court and said, Monsieur, A plus B to N divided by N equals X, so God exists. Please reply. And um, Diderot in the story was embarrassed by that and he could not grasp the math behind that and left the court. Um, so he was disqualified in that sense. Actually, as I said, this anecdote is not true, and Diderot really wrote uh, mathematical work, so he could understand this formula. It's another story where this anecdote came from. But I think it's interesting here because it points, you can tell several things here, but it points at a specific use of mathematics in this context. Here, mathematics was used to um, humiliate a person, and mathematics was used to disqualify a philosophical position. And in this case, it was successful, this attempt. Um, so it's probably a case of misuse of mathematics. Um, as I said, Euler did not say these words in reality. Um, so that not, has nothing to do with climate. And before I bring it together with, with social science and climate uh, research, I want to draw a kind of map how I structure research on climate change and to locate a little bit what I'm talking about that. So as a social scientist, I start with the social processes in society. There are economic processes, there are social processes, and so on and so forth. And some of these processes cause uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that's what we all know. And then they go to the air or to the ocean, probably, uh, indirectly, that goes through the climate system. And we have heard previous talks about that. Um, how we can understand the climate system, and that's not only the atmosphere, there are other systems linked to that as well. 
And some changes in the climate system have an effect back to society. These are climate impacts like sea level rise or a more frequent extreme weather events and so on and so forth. And so that feeds back to society. And on the societal side, there are now different ways to think about it. What should, should we do about that problem? How to deal with that? And there are roughly speaking two strategies. And the first one is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's called mitigation in jargon, meaning uh, attempts to solve this problematic cycle from its beginning. But of course, we all know climate is already changing. Even with strong mitigation policies, we cannot avoid climate change completely today. So there's another option discussed, and there's adaptation that goes to the other end of this causal chain. These are societal or technical measures to reduce the adverse consequences of those climate impacts. And climate change research from the social science perspective, as you might imagine, is mostly dealing with the lower part of this diagram here. But of course, it has to take account of several insights of the upper part here. And you will see examples for that in a minute. But so um, it's the specific thing here is that it's a, a social science research that also deals in an interdisciplinary way with, with other um, disciplines here. Um, now, going into these societal processes, I will bring three examples now. Um, and the first is on. Um, in environmental agreements, the international ones. There are global negotiations every year um, to come to an agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally. Um, and there are other environmental agreements on the national level as well as uh, the um, Convention for the Protection of the, of the Ozone Layer. And there has been, um, you might have noticed, and in the end of November, there has two weeks of talks in Warsaw on this issue. Uh, next, we, next year, they will be in, in Lima and probably in, uh, in Paris in 2015, we will have such an agreement globally. I'm not sure whether that will really be the case, uh, but uh, of course, several hope so. And that's a matter of research. How, how can such an agreement be reached? What can and or why is it not reached? Or what determines whether there can be a kind of global, uh, a global consensus? And uh, one way to research that is using game theory, that's a way to formalize these kind of international relation questions with mathematical constructs, and thereby making some crucial assumptions. As every model, as every method, assumption has to be made. And here I want to po point out to some of those. Uh, first, um, these kind of work mostly consider nation states as a primary actor. So there are nation states meeting and agreeing or not agreeing on emission reduction. They, what these models usually do not depict are subnational entities or individual citizens. Uh, they behave nations as individual actors, and they are assumed as being rational. That has a specific meaning in uh, this kind of theory. Um, that is, every nation state tries to optimize a specific um, value or payoff um, uh, and do it, does it best and achieves it as well. And what is optimized here in these models? Um, there are first benefits from avoided climate change. So if emissions are reduced, there might be less damages from climate change in the future. But on the other hand, when you want to reduce emissions in your own countries, costs have been borne by the own economy. Um, you have to shift to maybe more expensive technologies. Um, so in this kind of models, every country weighs the benefits of avoided damage with the costs of uh, reducing emissions. Um, and since no country can prescribe what another country is doing, they can only try to make agreements, binding agreements, where, where they say, if you reduce this kind of this emissions by this amount, we will do so as well, but otherwise we will not. And that comes to the theory of coalitions. You can investigate. Once a treaty is made between different parties, will they stick to this treaty? There might be incentives to leave such a treaty, depending how this treaty is crafted and on the costs and benefits, how they're distributed. And you might think of other kind of non-stable or, or not perfectly stable treaties when you might think of the OPEC that had nothing to do with climate change primarily. The OPEC, the organizations of petro petroleum exporting countries, they try to reduce the output of oil together, 
but usually there are some countries that uh, that don't stick to the rules that are negotiated within the OPEC. So there's a tendency of those coalitions to be unstable. And there's a lot of research since that since the 1990s uh, on these environmental agreements. There's more, there are more simple game theoretical models. There are complex ones. There are realistic ones. There are more theoretical ones. And there are some general insights that emerge from that. And the first one, maybe it's the most well known, uh, also reported in other literature, is a free rider problem. That's the basic core. The problem is if one country reduces emissions, these costs are paid in that country. But all other countries also benefit from this climate protection efforts, even if they have no emission reductions. Um, so there is a tendency not to contribute in these kind of agreements. Another general insight that popped up in very different models uh, is, uh, refers to these coalitions when they are stable. And this theoretical uh, research finds out when um, environment problems are shallow, so that means you have not so much costs in solving them, stable coalitions tend to be large. And if you have deep problems that are with high costs associated, stable coalitions are small. So that's a kind of bad news second order. So even if we allow for coalitions to solve the free rider problem, we run up into the second problem, at least for the severe problem. So for the severe environmental problems, coalitions are not the solutions. Um, I don't know how these results influenced current negotiations. Um, I, um, I, he can only speculate, but um, both, both results are rather negative. They can be um, uh, um, uh, provide a, a thought that it might be impossible to find an agreement. And the other thing is even the very realistic models, game theoretical models in this framework, they are not able to predict what the outcome of negotiations are. There are several attempts, but these models are not detailed enough or not good enough. And maybe from principal reasons, they cannot predict what will happen in the next, or say, next five years in these negotiations. So you might ask, what are these models good for? I've done research in that field as well, personally. But you might ask, oh, okay, maybe it's, uh, um, it has some general insights, but what is this actually used? So that's my first example. Um, the second example has a more local focus. Um, is our, about emissions trading systems. You might know that in Europe we have a European emissions trading system um, and the basic idea very simply pictured in this graph is here that you might have different firms with different amounts of emissions. Um, they all get assigned by the, by the regulator, by the government, assigned of amount of emissions they can release. But if some firms don't use up this overall amount so because they emit less, they can sell these leftover allowances for emissions to another firm that emits more. And of course, they make some payment for that. Um, this idea uh, of emissions trading systems that are now um, in, in place in, 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 uh, in the European Union, um, in California, in, in, in some northeastern American states, China is introducing an emissions trading system. Australia has introduced, but also again extraduced uh, some weeks ago, that's another story, but it's a quite powerful idea in real uh, political design. That was suggested by a Canadian economist John Dales in 1968 in a more essayistic fashion. It was it's a very long text where he explores different ideas in this direction, but the more influential one was a paper um, by John Montgomery from 1972 who puts it on a on a uh, neoclassical ground, that's a specific stream of thought in economists, and that's also very tied to mathematical analysis. To the lower right here is just a snapshot from this paper to see what kind of style of argument is there, so I don't expect you here to go into this formula here. Um, but he has shown for in this paper for a very specific uh, but still general setting that um, emissions trading systems have several very good features, and the main feature is um, that they can achieve a political target for emission reductions at minimal costs to the whole economy. So you can, the political, po political system says you want to reduce emissions to that and that level, and the question is how we can achieve that without paying too much. And that's achieved here, 
and it's achieved although every firm just strives to maximize its individual uh, profits. So it's just, um, with, when, once the rules are set up, every firm follows its individual optimal calculus and we come up with a social optimal outcome. And you, know, you might have read um, uh, or heard, uh, for example, for the difficulties from the European emissions trading system, and there are now several attempts to resurvive or resurrect that. Uh, and the first round of the emission trading system, when it was firstly introduced, was even worse. So there is a market uh, of emission certificates really broke down. So it might be not that simple as Montgomery has written in this very um, technically advanced paper. And when you read in those old, older writings of um, John Dales, you find very interesting discussions of problems that might occur with such an emissions trading system that did not appear in this later work. And you, uh, when you read that now, you have a kind of um, uh, aha, yeah, because ah, they knew that already in advance, but in the politic politicians that implemented these emissions trading system kept more to the simple part. So although this mathematical or economic mathematical result is quite advanced and, and, and has this also is, is has a kind of aesthetic value even, yeah, and it's very strong, it does not catch up with what the essay four years earlier could express. And I don't know whether we would have such long, long examples of emissions trading systems now if this paper of Montgomery had no, has not been written by someone else or by him. Well, that's my second example of use where math and social science is actually politically used or implemented even. Um, example number three, um, and that's maybe more close to the simulation part we've heard about climate models. Of course, there are also economic models that are somehow linked to climate models. And that's just a graph. It's, it's, uh, it shows you a snapshot of an even larger graph that describes the basic structure of one of these models. I don't want to go into the detail here. But you see there are a lot of components here. And there are components that are climatic. Uh, there are CO2 concentrations, the atmosphere. But there are also a lot of economic uh, uh, variables included here. These are basically the capacities of different Energy sources like nuclear, biomass, renewables, fossil energy sources. Um, you have the available amount of labor. Um, you have technical progress, and so on and so forth. You can then make them that arbitrarily complex. And then you can make calculations. For example, suppose the economic and the climate systems work as depicted in this model. Um, and suppose we have a political target of reducing emissions or keeping greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere below a specific level, what would be the cost-efficient energy mix to achieve that? So much, how much nuclear or fossils or renewables would we need to achieve that as minimal costs? And that's a graph of one model, but there are more out of that. And now I'll show you three pictures from our model comparison studies um, uh, just for three models. These are three models um, that all assume the same basic scenario. All these models uh, want to achieve uh, uh, um, that the uh, atmospheric concentration of carbon remains below 550 ppn m over, the, over this century. And uh, they all compute the cost optimal mix of primary energy sources according to these categories. So they are comparable. They had, all these model studies have agreed on the same basic conditions, but the details of the models are different. And you see the results are so as well. Of course, if the details are different, the results are different. So we see, for example, models with a larger share of, of fossil fuels or a larger share of nuclear energy. So what can we learn from that when we want to make an energy transition or change something politically if there are so much different results? First, you might say, yeah, let's, oh, it's very astonishing. We don't know so much about how the economy will develop over 100 years. Um, so uh, we might get, think, get rid of that. Yeah. On the other hand, such kind of computations are requested by negotiators in the global negotiations I was pointing at earlier. Um, they use these numbers to weigh their own uh, positions in these, uh, in these negotiations, um, although they know they are so different. Um, and even more extreme, um, some countries 
don't trust the models that are developed in other countries, so they develop their own ones. Yeah? Although they know they will be different from the other as well. So it's, it's, everyone knows that that is not objective knowledge, but countries invest resources to develop those still, yeah? because they maybe play an important political function in these negotiations and in other settings as well. Um, so these are my three examples, and by reflecting on them, I want to tee together some, say, pros and cons of using mathematical methods in this kind of research. Um, and I want to start with a critique here. Um, and the first point of critique, maybe that's a very old one that's brought forward by more qualitative working social scientists, is that uh, uh, math, or using math, leads to reductionism. So, um, the issues you want to investigate are reduced to numbers, variables, and formulas, and that do not capture essential features. And one kind of essential feature that is frequently posed here is the reflexiveness of human action. So when we want to understand what humans, human beings or organizations do, um, of course they function differently like a physical system. Human beings have expectations about the future and that strongly shape what we are doing. Human beings have routines in action that are shaped by the past, and human beings have an have and self-imaginations what they are and what they want to achieve. They follow norms. Um, and this kind of critique claims um, that that might be not uh, adequately expressed by uh, mathematical expressions. Um, a third kind of critique, and that's related to predicting the future in particular, and we've shown these, I've shown these examples from the economic sides. Of course, when you want to predict the future with a with a mathematical construct, you have to assume that some parts of this mathematical constructs remain invariant over time. Maybe the variables change in value, but you assume that the equations that are hold today will also hold tomorrow or in 100 years. And there, specific social scientists sometimes criticize um, that that's particularly difficult for, for um, uh, ec uh, economic or social uh, issues to have these invariant conditions. So the last two point of critiques that relate back more to the initial anecdote I've brought with Euler and Diderot, um, that some say such a kind of model, in particular large models, are like a black box. They use the numbers that come out of the black box, are used as a kind of argument enhancer, um, but no one knows where, where the numbers actually come from, no one can really understand what is meant by that, except those that have built these models. Um, so uh, it might remain a black box, and I think there are for sure some, also some, in, when you develop models, large models in large teams, there are issues of quality here, um, but that can, might be organized. But maybe even more strong is that you, that um, some claim that these kind of analytical or mathematical results are claimed as being ob uh, an objective truth. Maybe it's not explicitly claimed, because uh, users of mathematics are quite well aware of some of these criticisms, but once the number is out there, people might frequently think or implicitly assume that it has a kind of objective value, um, and it's true. And of course, that can be used by, for example, by parties that buy expertise from scientists this way. And I know that also from collaboration as a scientist with people from practice that. Um, for example, town and city planners request numbers to have good arguments uh, for their political departments. And although they might not use a number in the end, but having numbers gives some, that some power. And of course, that can be misused. But when we look on the scope that mathematics has in the social sciences, I think there's some of mirrors, some of these critiques. Um, and we've seen the example in the talk before how math might help to come up with more clear-cut definitions of concepts. Um, the mathematical language is quite precise, so those that are working uh, as social scientists with math are forced to be very precise that it works, and they need also to be very explicit about the assumptions they make. And maybe the assumptions in economic models, for example, might be more debatable than in fluid dynamics. You have to write them down, and then, then you can start transparently with a discussion about that. 
And as a third point, I think that's the main feature of math you have. You can compute, you can deduce, you follow the rules of logic and mathematics, and then you can, uh, can um, make conclusions from your assumptions in a more or less ingenious or automatic way. You can test, you can test those conclusions by following the rules. Um, and when you don't use the rules of logic, you might say you come up with anything. You might come. So in this sense, every good social scientist, even if it's a person not using math at all, needs to have some, some root uh, in, in a logic as well. Um, the fourth point where I see a scope, I put it with a question mark that also relates just to the last talk, that you might say that mathematics kind, might be a joint language where um, practitioners and scientists from different backgrounds might work. So they may have different uh, issues, different perspectives, but when they converge or try to converge of, on, a, on a mathematical construct, they can uh, um, somehow communicate. So the, the formulas or, or variables or uh, so might be a kind of um, neutral language that's neutral to the scientific issues involved there. Uh, a critique to that might be that that includes uh, mathematically challenged people, that they have no mathematical training. Yeah, so maybe it may be a good joint language to bring together uh, engineers and economists, but maybe not so good to bring in the sociologists here. Um, so there are limits here as well. Um, and the last point here that refers to the misuse as objective truth on the other side. Um, uh, models or um, mathematical construct can, even if they are not objective true, they can reduce our societal, societal uncertainty about issues. And so I'm also working as an institutional economist that, uh, that uh, um, cares about how we deal or design our rules in society and our organization, how to structure our organizations. And one basic insight from institutional economics that those institutions are partially re uh, needed to reduce our uncertainty in our everyday dealings. And when we have one model we can agree on, for example, even if we know it's not objective, we can say we orient toward that. And so we can uh, communicate. And an example for that is our technical norms, for example. There are technical norms that are designed, the technical designs fit to specific climatic conditions. So you build a car differently from the, for the Sahara or for England. Yeah? And this is written down in technical norms. These technical norms are not based on perfect knowledge on the climate condition in the future, but when you stick to the norms in constructing a car, you are not liable if there is a mistake, actually. So it's, it gives the clarity who is responsible, who bears with risks, risk, risk, and so it helps uh, uh, with our everyday or economic life. So in this sense, even non-objective uh, truths might help here, uh, in a sense. So. What is the way forward? What would you do with this kind of critique? Of course, we can weigh that for every case differently, and that but brings me to the to the last slide, to my to my final statement, um, how we can use mathematics in an adequate way, having in mind these kind of critiques and also the possibilities, um, and that's the use of games, of serious games, and I bring that. Uh, in particular, with here with an example, so an example of for such a serious games is a, a climate game, Keep Cool, where you play international climate politics. I just tell that because I was involved, strongly involved in the design and development of that game in an interdisciplinary team, and because that's a small advertising part, it's fresh out of the presses in a new release. So if you need something for Christmas, it might be interesting. Um, but it's more, it's more than that. When you develop such a game, um, you discover, or you play with games, you, you discover several similarities with using mathematics in, uh, in social science. Maybe the obvious one is the role of rules in a game. When you make a rule, you have certain degrees of freedom. When you play a game, you have certain degrees of freedom. You can make decisions, but these decisions have to follow rules. When you go one step further, that is not allowed to contradict by the rules to the step before that. So they develop step by step such a game and you follow rules. And the rules somehow um, might say, might be the deductive rules that mathematics has to follow as well. That's the one part. But the other part is which rules do you choose? And by selecting or describing or crafting rules, you 
um, uh, pick out certain specific elements of reality that is, are interesting to you and represent them in this game dynamics. Yeah? So when you're playing Monopoly, uh, there is a specific uh, focus on the rents you pay for, for housing. Yeah? And in, in Keep Cool, there's a specific focus on which kind of investments you do and what emissions that causes. Um, so um, kind of designing or crafting a game is a part of making a model of a very specific part of reality. But then human beings come into that game, so that makes it somehow unpredictable what the outcome will be. So a single game run does not produce some objective truth. It's just one experiment. Um, and everyone, uh, everyone understands that when you play a game, no one expects that objective truth will be the outcome. But when you play a serious game frequently or change it probably, um, you can nevertheless learn something about reality. You can find out what are core issues that need to be focused on, what are not so important issues. You can work on getting a joint understanding, a joint language to discuss these issues. So um, when you take now the real use of math and the social science as a kind of play, a game you play like such a game, um, um, I would claim that it gives you an appropriate um, position towards these kind of methods. So the final hypothesis I want to make here is that the use of mathematics in social science research on climate change is like crafting and playing serious games. And here I want to close. Thanks for your attention.